I am so glad you're here because today we're delving into the fascinating world of vitigree agents. Specifically, we're going to be looking at their structure, the mechanism of action, and their applications for organic synthesis. And stick around to the end for some practice problems to help you on your next exam. At the heart of vitig chemistry lie what are known as phosphorus ilates, which are also called vitigree agents. These remarkable compounds serve as invaluable intermediates in the synthesis of alkenes from carbonyl compounds. The technical definition of an ilid is any time you have two atoms that are adjacent to one another with opposite charges. When drawn in this resonance structure, we can see that due to the electronegativity difference between carbon and phosphorus, carbon is going to be partially negative, whereas phosphorus is going to be partially positive. However, we know that we can draw a resonance structure for this molecule where we place the electrons on the carbon atom. So we can redraw this where phosphorus now has a fully positive charge and carbon, the phosphorus to carbon bond is now a single bond and there is a negative charge on carbon with a lone pair. And this gives us a reasonable resonance structure for this phosphorus ilid known as a vitigree agent. Importantly, this means that we have generated a carbon nucleophile, which is pretty rare in organic chemistry. The mechanism of a vitig reaction is elegantly simple yet profoundly impactful. The carbon nucleophile will attack the carbon electrophile of carbonyl compounds allowing us to remove the pi electrons and place them on oxygen. This generates an intermediate where now we have a carbon attachment from the original ilid, and we are left with a negatively charged oxygen atom that has three lone pairs. And these three lone pairs are going to be attracted to the positive charge that is built up on phosphorus. So therefore, we will generate an interaction between these where the lone pair will attack the phosphorus electrophile. The next intermediate in this mechanism is what is called an oxophosphatane, where now we have a four-membered ring which can undergo what is called a 2 plus 2 cycloaddition by moving the electrons where the oxygen is now going to be doubly bound to the phosphorus atom, and our new carbon-carbon bond is going to be an alkene. So this generates our final product, which began as a carbonyl and is now an alkene. And again, this also releases an oxygen with a double bond to the phosphorus atom. Now the reaction we just saw used a symmetrical carbonyl and a symmetrical vitig reagent to produce ultimately a symmetrical alkene. Now importantly, we don't have to use symmetrical molecules as our starting reagents. Take a look at it, for example, if you had benzaldehyde reacting with this vitig reagent, which contains a single methyl group coming from the carbon that is doubly bound to the phosphorus atom. This would produce two different options. We can produce the E and Z isomers of the alkene. However, it turns out that generally speaking, the produced species is going to oftentimes, in most cases, be the Z isomer. So this is the Z isomer. Remember, each of these alkyl groups coming off the alkene are on Z same side. So we call this the Z isomer. And it turns out that, in fact, that the ratio of Z to E is typically around 85 to 15 percent Z isomer. However, that is not true if you use vitig reagents that have a strong electron withdrawing groups on their substituent of, from the alkene. Importantly, in, in fact, you'll note that in these circumstances, when you have a strongly electron withdrawing group like you do with this ester, you actually tend to produce almost exclusively the E isomer. So in fact, the only isomer that would be formed in this reaction would be the E isomer. And again, it all comes from the fact that if your Wittig reagent has a strongly electron withdrawing group. Now let's try some practice problems to help you on your next exam. Pause the video, try these problems independently, and then resume the video for the solutions. For the first question, we're turning this carbonyl into an alkene using a symmetrical Wittig reagent. So when we do this problem, we do not need to consider the stereochemistry. And in fact, I know that this will produce an alkene that looks just like this, where both of the methyl groups are coming off. However, you'll notice that the second reaction does not contain a symmetrical alkene. In fact, on this other side is just a hydrogen. So therefore, I do need to consider the relative stereochemistry of the alkene that's formed. And remember, we discussed that the Z isomer, as long as there's no electron withdrawing group on the Wittig reagent, is going to dominate. 
So for that reason, I know that my final product is actually going to be that Z isomer. So therefore, the alkyl group, which is coming off, the methyl group, is going to be pointed in the same direction as the largest substituent, which is this cyclohexane ring. So this would be the Z isomer, and these would be the products of the first reaction. For the next question, we're looking at what an example of multi-step synthesis, where we need to remember reactions that we've learned about previously in this course in order to get the right answer. So in this example, we're using this nitrobenzaldehyde, and we have our Wittig reagent, which has a relatively electron withdrawing group on it. I also see something that is probably going to be important to remember, and that is called the acetal protecting group. Remember that from a previous video about nucleophilic addition reactions of carbonyls and the formation of acetals. So I know that Wittig reagents allow us to turn carbonyl groups into alkenes, which means that I can basically just redraw this molecule, replace the carbonyl group with instead this new alkene that came from our Wittig reagent, and everything else should basically look the exact same, where I'm still left with my acetal. Now importantly, the next step is to add a, an acid to the solution. And if I remember from the previous video about the formation of acetals as a protecting group, I know that by adding an acid, we can actually deprotect this group. And for this reason, my final product is actually going to regenerate an aldehyde. So the, most of the molecule will look basically the same. I will still have my two alkenes, but now instead of having the acetal group here, I have instead my aldehyde. And this is the final product in this multi-step synthesis. Using Wittig reagents and nucleophilic addition reactions of acetals, to complete this multi-step synthesis. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. If you have any questions related to this chemistry content or anything else, drop it as a comment down below and I'd be happy to help you out. I'll see you in the next video.